let me let me be quite honest. If I was 21, 21 now and an undergraduate student, I would not join debating. I would not. So there, there are a couple of uh, videos online of uh, Jordan Peterson speaking at Oxford <laughs> Union. <laughs> Usually the title is something along the lines of Jordan Peterson shoots down feminist or something like this. And uh, usually you are in the thumbnail. You are asking the question. Tell me a little bit more about that experience. Like there. And I'm just like speaking and speaking and speaking. And then at one point, like, I think if I remember correctly, the chair asked me, like, do I want to stop? And I I've noticed that there was like blood. <laughs> and that I actually... Elena, welcome to the podcast. Uh, it's uh, great to have you on. I, I, I think uh, you are definitely one of those people that uh, a lot of younger debater wants to hear from. And this is a great opportunity for me as a fanboy of uh, previous Belgrades uh, as well. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to, to be here. It's been a while since I did anything debating related. So I guess it's very nice to be here as well. Thanks for the invite and for the compliments as well. Yeah, so the first question I always ask is, how do you feel? Oh, well, I mean, you know, it's um, it's interesting to, I guess, uh, go back into debating waters. Of course, this is not like a tournament or anything, but even just like talking about it and sitting here with you today, it's sort of like uh, going back in time and trying to remember, you know, what, what it was like to be a debater and wondering whether like, you know, because I haven't really like followed what happened in debating ever since I left. I'm almost curious to hear, like, what questions will you ask me? Will I have anything intelligent really to say? Because I don't know what's going on in the circuit anymore. But um, it's it's nice. It's nice to sort of be back in a way, I guess. Yeah, the vibe we are always going for is, uh, as Ashish put it, imagine that uh, the top is out. We are at the competition and we're just uh, smoking cigarettes uh, in front of the venue, yeah. talking about life and stuff. Yeah, those are the best part of the tournaments, I'd say. So I'll, I'll get back to that pretty easily. <laughs> yeah. Um, the first thing I want to ask about, which is potentially the most badass story in debating, is uh, the one where you beat your tongue. I think it was, uh, <laughs> I think it was uh, World Semis or something. You can it tell us more about that. Yeah, so it was the it was the world quarters in Malaysia. And I think Siri would remember all the details much better than I do. I, I seem to remember that Harvard, who ended who ended up also being in the semis with us, was in the opening government. And I remember that we were closing up. I can't remember who was the opening up and who was the closing up. I know that one of those two teams was Monash. And um, it was one of these debates, like Siri just gave the extension speech. And to me, who was the whip speaker, and I was sort of like listening what is going on in the room. And I, I had a feeling, you know, like I remember sitting there and, and having a feeling that we might just go to the semis, you know, like this, this might happen. We, we haven't been total shit. Like actually our case made sense. It had very good engagement with opening government. Like I think we said more relevant things than opening up. I, didn't quite like the closing government's extension. So I was just sitting there and I was like, oh my God, like I, we, we might, we might go to semis, right? So Siri gives a speech. I'm listening to the government whip. I get ready to stand and I start my speech and, and I can sort of feel that I kind of just bit myself, but it didn't, I guess it was the adrenaline, it must've been the adrenaline. Otherwise, like I probably should have collapsed. Right. But I can feel that I sort of bit my tongue, but I'm just like continuing. I'm giving the speech and I don't even know how many minutes I was in, but I've noticed that a lot of people in the audience are looking at me like, you know, like something's wrong, right? So I look at Siri and I can see that he's also looking at me like something's wrong, but the adrenaline is still like there. And I'm just like speaking and speaking and speaking. And then at one point, like, I think if I remember correctly, the chair asked me like, do I want to stop? And I I've noticed that there was like blood <laughs> and that I actually probably bit off my tongue. And I was like, no, we have to continue because I had a feeling that my speech was like really good. And I felt that like I was really nailing, like, you know, bringing our case there, like really making making the points quite strong. So I finished the speech and you know, I mean, blood, <laughs> the adrenaline is worn off. It really hurts. It actually really, really hurts. I can't really talk anymore because my tongue is like swollen. 
And I remember everyone is like rushing towards me and George, who is also the member of the Serbian delegation, but my first ever debating supervisor and mentor asks me like, are you okay? Are you coughing up blood? Like what is going on? And I'm just like, no, 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 like it's, it's fine. I just bit up my tongue. And then Siri was like, can you debate for tomorrow? And I was like, Jesus, like I could have been, you know, coughing blood out of my lungs. And the only thing you care about is like, can I speak tomorrow? But we were very competitive at the time, I guess. And, um, and then, you know, Siri, who obviously is the very best debating partner that I ever could have hoped for, uh, basically spends the next two hours like bringing me water and giving me ice, just taking care of me. And then we went to that room where they were about to announce the semifinalists. And then when, when I mean, obviously, you know, I, I can't even verbalize how I felt at that point because it was all kind of, you know, when I entered the debating and when I realized that like Siri and I have the capability to be a very successful debating team, it's all I really wanted. I, I really wanted, my, my true motivation was to do something no one's ever done before. And my true motivation was to show that to be an ESL or quite frankly EFL, which is what Siri and I, according to the guidelines actually are, that, it, that you know, that such teams can compete with all the rest of them, that they can defeat all these other Oxford and Cambridge and all these other teams. And, you know, when, when they said that Belgrade's going through to the semifinals, it was, it was, you know, my dream came true. Something that I've worked for for like three years uh, materialized. And the only thing I do remember is Siri saying, you have to bleed to kick out Monash. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Uh, and yeah, then basically up until the next day, Siri was just bringing me water, bringing me ice preventing me from speaking with anyone so that my tongue has enough time to recover. And, and it did. I, I, I gave, I'm, I'm quite proud of the speech I've, I've given in the semis as well. So that's the story. That, that's really the story. I guess if you want to, if you want to be the first ESL slash EFL team to make it to the semis and kick out Monash while you're at it, you kind of have to bleed. <laughs> yeah. I think this is a great story that exemplifies um, a lot of, uh, I would say your character uh, as a team especially and what I personally from like a completely different generation have known you for so with that being said here's the question that I have uh, a lot of the successful ESL EFL teams throughout the years many of them have looked back at certain role models and used them as a motivation to say okay this is possible this is what me and Ruman did uh, going into debating. This is what probably uh, Lovro and Tin did, for example, or Miosh and Yanko. But I'm not sure if that was the case for you. So what, what was it like kind of being in that mindset of being the first? But the build-up to that is what is more interesting to me. What is in your head when you're not really sure whether this can be actually done? Well... It was weird, right? So huh, the first ever international tournament that Thierry and I went to, like a major one was Manchester Euros and it, it was a failure. We didn't, we didn't even break. And, you know, the, the student accommodation room in which City stayed uh, has seen and felt the consequences of our anger because we were so sad. We barely managed to stand there while we were listening to the break because from what I recall in round nine of that Euros, uh, we were in a room where hypothetically we could have broken open, we could have broken ESL, we could have done both, right? And then we just ended up getting a force. We were completely irrelevant in the room. We had a case that no one really engaged with. We thought it was amazing, but turns out it was bollocks. And then we ended up not breaking at all in any of the categories. And then we basically spent, you know, we, we were just about able to hold our composition while they were reading out uh, who broke. And then as soon as that was done, I know that we walked back to the accommodation and basically got really drunk and kind of smashed half of that room. I mean, we didn't make any like permanent damages. We didn't like pay for anything, but you know, it was a very, it was a very emotional night. And then that was followed with yet another failure because the following competition was Berlin Worlds. And Siri and I were kind of like the favorites to qualify for it and to go and to succeed. And then we didn't even qualify. Like we, we had Belgrade qualifications and we just didn't, we didn't pass. <laughs> So that was yet another night of uh, rather sad and semi-aggressive behavior towards Bushes outside of the law faculty of University of Belgrade. And then I think we kind of just, you know, went to Chennai, which was, I mean, it was the first time that we realized that 
as a team were actually quite good. And, you know, Chennai, we ended up in the ESL finals and we were the first two EFL speakers. And obviously that was, you know, I guess what I'm really proud of is that nowadays EFL speakers end up in top 10 open speakers, right? But back at the time, to be the first EFL speaker, someone who came from the Serbian debating circuit, it was a success, let alone to be in the ESL world championship, right? So in the finals. So, and I guess that was the first time when we were like, okay, we, we can actually be a really, really, really good ESL team. And I guess then, you know, we were looking up to mainly Israeli teams. I remember Anat Shapira was like a role model for me. And Lila Kunig was also like a big role model for me. And I guess that at the time, at least from my point of view, we were aiming to be, you know, ESL champions. We thought that even though that was unimaginable for the Serbian debating circuit at the time, we thought that we could go on par with like the Dutch debating circuit or the Israeli debating circuit and be the ESL champions. And I think that's like the aim that we've set for ourselves uh, when we went to Zagreb Euros. But then in Zagreb, I think certain things have happened, which at least for me, opened, like it just opened my mind. It made me realize that to set myself the aim to just be the ESL champion is kind of already playing into the ice ceiling that existed for the ESL community, which was like, you can win your own category and basically stay out of our category. It's not that anyone said that, but that's how it felt, right? But then when we've ended up, for example, in round three of Zagreb Euros with all the native teams in the top room, and I believe we won that room. And then when I ended up being the sixth open speaker at Zagreb Euros, which I think was the first time that an ESL speaker has done something like that, at least in the modern debating times. Um, again, Siri would know about these record-breaking things much more than I do. I think that was the first time when I was like, why, why am I playing into this limit? Why? Like, the, the idea of these categories is, of course, to acknowledge the fact that if English is not your native language, you might struggle. But that is nothing, that, that says very little to nothing about one's debating abilities. And if I can be in the top room with Oxford and Cambridge and beat them, and if I can, you know, be in nine room, nine rounds with native speakers and end up in the top 10 open speakers, then you know what? I'm no longer just going to aspire to be an ESL champion. I'm going to aspire to be a champion. And I'm going to, you know, try and do the unimaginable for the, not just ESL community, I think for the open community as well. You know, I don't want to say that people were like purposefully discriminating us. I, I really don't think that was the case. I don't think that, you know, judges would genuinely back in 2014 walk into a room see an ESL team and automatically assume they can't defeat an open team I don't think that was the case but do I think that for them it was also unimaginable sure and do I think that that at least subconsciously played a role in how they evaluated certain arguments against others sure and I played into that as well I guess until the end of um until the end of Zagreb era was when I was like okay maybe I've said the aim which if I achieve it it will be absolutely amazing it would be a historic success for the Serbian debating community it would be a historic success for me and Stefan as well but maybe I can do more and there's nothing that stops me from trying to do more and if I don't do it it's fine but if I can do it it's it's both going to mean a lot for me personally it's going to be a lot it's going to mean a lot for me and Stefan as a team it's obviously going to mean a lot mean a lot for the Serbian debating community but then also in the end I just think like for the whole circuit to just show to everyone that you can be from any country, from any debating background, from any linguistic background, but you can defeat any other team. At the end of the day, you are debating the team. You're not debating the privileges that some people walk into the room or don't walk into the room with, if that kind of makes sense. So I guess that was, that was, that was it for me. Zagreb Euros was really like a turning point where I realized that dreaming big also can mean that you achieve big. So why debating, right, is the question that I keep asking myself in this situation. What makes you uh, enjoy an activity or be as competitive in activity to the point in which when there are some failures, you trash a hotel room, you get drunk, all those things. What, uh, what uh, makes it uh, special? Well, so... I, I mean, I started debating for a very weird reason. So the context is that I never really, so I, I graduated political sciences, went on to do a master's and PhD in politics as well. Um, but I, 
ended up at the Faculty of Political Sciences because I didn't succeed at my acting academy application, right? So when the only thing I ever wanted to be was an actress. And um, the only thing that I was preparing as, as like the university admissions were approaching uh, was the acting academy. And up until that point in my life, whenever I really, truly committed myself to something, I always succeeded. And because I was so committed to acting, my assumption was I'm working so hard, I'm doing all the required steps. Of course, I'm going to be successful at it. And guess what? I wasn't. I failed the entry exam. And the only university that still had applications open back at the time was the Faculty of Political Sciences. So I applied for the faculty. I'm, believe it or not, there were 100 people that they've admitted. I was the last one on the list. Like, I just barely got into the, into the program. And... I was really sad and really, really, really depressed because I'm not an actress. I was, I was too proud to try again, even though literally everyone tells you that like almost no one passes the entry exam for the first time, that you have to do it multiple times. But I was just too proud, too sad, too devastated to try again because I really couldn't deal with the failure on one hand. But then at the same time, I was just like very sad and depressed because I'm studying politics. I didn't want to do this. And then my cousin, my, my brother, in fact, in English, it would be a cousin in Serbia. We use the term brother to mean something much broader than a sibling. Um, he told me, look, I can't fix your desire to be an actress. I can't make you an actress. But I can tell you this activity that will at least give you some stage presence. And if you want to make it dramatic, by all means, you can. So that's how I started debating. And from day one, I don't know, I guess I liked it because of course, it gave me that I can be on the stage and speak and have a huge audience in front of me. Um, the conversations and the topics were really interesting. And I had the opportunity to talk about things I otherwise never would have, learn things I otherwise never would have. And then, you know, as you start going to tournaments and you meet a lot of interesting people and you start traveling, I guess one thing leads to another. And it makes it like a very, very special and very unique activity. Um, so that, that's, that's, I guess, my answer to why debating. It was, it was by an accident, um, but then just ended up being, you know, this space where you could talk about anything with extremely intelligent and smart and curious people and travel across the world and meet various different cultures, whilst also, you know, in my case, getting the stage presence and getting to fulfill the competitive side I've always had. I've always been competitive, and I guess, you know, debating, debating also played into that a bit. It also almost seems to be a reoccurring theme with these conversations. When I talk a lot uh, with uh, different speakers, especially successful speakers, like with you, one of your most uh, prominent speeches that a lot of people know is that Euro's final speech, which is a very rhetorical speech. Uh, not that it's, it doesn't have a lot of analysis behind it, but it's a powerful one. It's a memorable one. Uh, and those speeches we remember along with uh, the Bosel speech maybe from the finals or maybe some other speeches like that. And uh, it seems a lot of debaters uh, love, uh, especially I would say one of the great speakers, love the per performance part of it. I've always loved the performance part of it. I wanted to go to film school before I uh, uh, tricked myself into believing I could be a law student. Um but uh, the question that I have here is, um, does it satisfy the need? And when you're over with it, does that need still uh, resume with you? The, the need to perform, the need to be heard, to voice out your opinions? Yeah, uh, of course. I mean, at least, you know, I think, I think what's beautiful about debating is that it attracts people who love the performance and the public speaking like myself, but it also can accommodate for people who like debating but are not necessarily as much into performance and, and public speaking in and of itself. And I think to those people who, who are not that much into it, I think it also like teaches them how to do that. And of course, it taught me as well. Um, I mean, yeah, sure. I, you know, I, I, I'm not in debating anymore. I was one of those people who was of a view that I need to retire as a debater as soon as I'm done with my undergrad program. And, and I was, I, I CA'd tournaments here and there during my master's. Of course, there were the two European championships, but I didn't debate. I, 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 was, I was done. I, I, to, to be quite frank with you, I, I remember that I felt that I was done after Malaysia Worlds. Um, 
I was very excited to get into the semis. I, you know, obviously wanted to go to the final, but it wasn't so crucial for me. Like the second they read out my name that I'm in the semifinals of the open category, like I felt that, you know, if we get to the final and if we win, of course, it's going to be cherry on top of the cake, but I already have my cake and I, I was very happy with that. Um, Stefan really wanted to go and do Vienna Euros one last time because that was our last opportunity to to speak together because we, we were not going to be students again. I, of course, had the opportunity to continue debating because I was a student, right, for six more years after I've stopped studying, undergrad program, that is. But um, I felt I needed to make space for other people and let other people compete. I've done two worlds. I, I've done three Euros. I, I thought that it was enough. I thought that when it comes to debating, I've achieved all I can as a speaker. You know, whether you end up in a final or not, it's, it's just one more round. Like the, the accumulation of everything that we've done for me just felt enough. Um, and I felt that the need to perform and the need to voice my opinions, I felt that it was time to do it in, in a different forum. So on one hand, you know, I obviously see eight competitions and trained some debating communities because I thought that was one of the ways in which I can give back to the community that gave so much to me. But then at the same time, you know, I started teaching at a high school in Oxford and then I was a graduate teaching assistant at the LSC. Now I, you know, work in a political think tank where I get to voice my opinions in those kinds of forums. I just felt, you know, I, I felt this is a beautiful thing. I've done it for three years, I was as committed to it as one can possibly be, but it's time for me to leave and to other, to allow other people for their voices to, to be heard. Because the reality is, you know, I, I'm not going to lie. Siri and I at one point were the stars of the debating community. Right. And for as long as I stayed, I felt that my voice would dominate that other people could not be heard. And I felt, you know, it's my time to leave. And also I just felt that I said everything I had to say in debating. So I thought moving on is the right way forward. But now I, I use other spaces, you know, my job. I often provide public commentary on the political events in Serbia, on Serbian television and radio and newspaper. I do some of that for the British press as well. So I found other forums where I can like express myself that are not debating. Yeah, it's, it stays with you to a certain degree. Um, and, and I like that uh, on like uh, maybe living on a high note as well is something that uh, is kind of cool. I always like um, I think about the Tarantino example for 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 example, with Tarantino wants to do only ten movies, and uh, when he's asked about it, he always says it's uh, it's because I want to live on a high note. I, I want to be the best Tarantino, and everybody's like, oh my god, Tarantino when I leave. This is what I want people to remember. So it's kind of, um, it's, it's a great perspective to have. It's, it's also like, you know that, you know that, quote: you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. That, that's sort of how I saw it. From the very beginning, I knew that Siri and I just clicked so well as a team that I knew that I'm not interested in exploring anyone else as a potential debating partner. So basically from the very beginning, I knew as soon as I'm done with faculty of political sciences in Belgrade, I'm done with debating. Like I'm not going to be a competitive debater anymore. And I felt, you know, at that time I've done so much. There's just no need anymore. If I stayed, if I, you know, I just, I would have become a wishwash of debating. Just be, oh, here is yet another dinosaur coming around here at our tournament. <laughs> you know, just, it didn't, it didn't seem graceful to me. No, that, uh, that totally makes sense. So how did you and Siri become a team? Tell me a little bit about those early years in Serbia. Uh, what I know is uh, an interesting fact that, uh, so I think almost at every competition that you've been with Siri, you've outspoken Siri, but that is not the case for Serbian competitions. Uh, why, why do you think is that? Um, so how's your end? Let's, let's start with the easier question. Um, so I think I showed up at the first like induction debating workshop and then I didn't show up for several. And I remember then again, coming back to the debating workshop and they were doing the extension. They were just teaching the extensions. So we were like at the fifth or the sixth class ever since we began. And they thought that the time was right for us to kind of simulate what a debating speech would look like and what a debate would look like. And I think it was something about burqas. I think it was like banning burqas or some, something like that was a topic. And I know that I ended up being, I think, the government extension. We had no whip because only six of us attended the workshop. So the first half of the table were full teams. And then the second half were just the extension speeches. 
And I think I was the government extension and I think Stefan was the opposition extension or vice versa. But I know that both of us were giving extensions. And we got this topic and all I knew were like theoretical, analytical debating points that I could make. But I didn't know a lot of facts. Like I knew the basics about burqas, but could I like just draw a random example from a country? No. So I go and give this like what I would say was a solid speech for someone who's given a speech for the first time. Like, you know, analytical, all the usual suspect points about feminism, etc. But then this guy comes after me who is just like a walking fucking Google. Like he knows everything. And I knew that the Tsimbarats, the novice debating tournament in Serbia was coming up. And I was kind of, you know, I liked the activity. I wanted to do it. And I realized this guy, this guy has it. He knows a bunch of these random facts that I don't know. And I think we would click very well. So I've asked him. Georgi, who was our debating mentor at the time, also thought this was a terrific idea. And I think he kind of, as soon as he matched me and Stefan as a team, I think he kind of saw that there was a lot of potential because Siri and I are very different speakers and we approach emotion in a very different way, but in a way that is extremely compatible. I do a lot of things that he doesn't. He does a lot of things that I don't. I like and understand and can come up with really creative arguments on topics that Siri cannot. And he can come up with a lot of different interesting arguments on motions that I cannot. So in a way, we were extremely compatible, extremely complementary. And we've tried it in the Tsimbarats. And we were quite successful. We didn't win, but we were really, really, really good. And I think from that point on, at least while we were on the domestic slash regional circuit, it totally made sense for us to keep going as a team. And I think that the more competitions we've done, the more we've confirmed this idea that like, we are actually a very, very, very good team together. Um, and that's sort of how, how it stayed. I think at one point it became very clear that we were just such a match made in heaven debating wise that there was just no point in trying to, in, in trying to have Matt, like test me with someone else or him, him with someone else. So that's sort of how we became a team. And then in terms of like the speaking points, I, I don't know. I, I, I you know, I don't want to, I never thought of myself as a better or worse speaker than Siri. Maybe, maybe I delivered better at some points than others, but I truly and genuinely and deep to my heart always thought of us as a equally good team members of our team. And, and, you know, even when I ended up getting higher speaker points than him, you know, God knows if I, if I would have delivered that kind of a speech, if I had someone else as my partner, if someone else was there in the prep time to like, brainstorm with me and think about the strategy and think about the angles and vice versa. Like I, I, I suspect that, you know, Stefan, Stefan has pretty similar views. And then in terms of that particular discrepancy, I mean, I guess, um, why was I never a better speaker in the Serbian debating circuit? I guess you should ask that, um, all the Serbian judges who judged us over there. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get straight to the point. Was it because you're a woman? <sighs> I don't know. I look, I want to I want to hope that it wasn't, but I don't know. There were times, look. There were times when people did, did you know, there was this joke, I guess, all the time that Siri is writing my speeches and I I played into it. Of course that's not true. There were times, I'm going to say it up front, there were topics that we've got that I knew shit about where Siri was just like leading. Same things happen vice versa, right? We get a topic and Siri just doesn't know what to say. Like that, that's the point of being a team. Sometimes one of us is just going to know more than the other. But I guess in the Serbian debating community, this view that I never had an original thought or something or that Siri writes all of my speeches or something, I, I guess that kind of, or maybe, you know, maybe it's just the style. Maybe, maybe, you know, the fact that I was a more analytical speaker rather than facts, facts and then engaging those facts and, rebut and rebuttal. Like, I was never very good at rebuttal, for example. That, that was like the Siri thing. I was always like, here's our big point, and let me give you a strong analytical argument as to why this point stands true and why this point is better than anything else any of the other teams are saying. Uh, maybe, maybe it's just about, like, what the Serbian debating circuit valued at the time in terms of speeches and strategy and the content. Maybe it was because I was a woman. I, I don't know. I mean, I remember this, you know, this person never ended up having a big debating career anyway, so I feel okay saying that. But there was this one, I think it was our first Danny Crane. And we got this topic, this house believes that um, if if we were ever to like interact with aliens, women should be sent to, to negotiate with them. And we were closing government. And the opening opposition comes out and has this case of like, 
Look at the team in closing government. We all know Stefan's writing her speeches. That's clearly the reason why Stefan should be the one going to negotiate in space and why men should. So I asked Stefan, like, can I make a rebuttal that might be a bit offensive to you, but I just think brings the point down. He was like, do whatever the fuck you want. So I come out and I'm like, look, it is absolutely true. Stefan is writing all of my speeches, but I tend to on balance be a better speaker than Stefan. So I think Stefan should write the dialogue and I should go to space to negotiate with aliens. Um, so you know, that was, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. As I say, it, it might be. I, I don't think anyone was like, I don't think I've ever personally directly experienced sexism. So I'm not inclined to say, oh, it was because I'm a woman. But it is odd that that's the way it happened. It is odd that there is not a single Serbian debating competition where I outspoke Stefan. But, you know, it is what it is. I don't hold a grudge about that. I never personally cared. As I say, I, I always exclusively cared about the two of us succeeding as a team and who ends up higher on the speaker tab really didn't care about that too much. No, I, I agree. It's a, it's a team game um, and you never really know what's going on in that prep time in the build up to those speeches. So it's always, I think, a shared um, result, if I can say it like this. Uh, yeah. Do you think that uh, there are some biases uh, in debating in general? Uh, from the perspective of being a woman uh, or do you think that as com in comparison the debating community is fairly open to these kind of things obviously like there are some very bad examples throughout uh, uh, debating and sexism but how big of an issue is it really is so i can well I can only really speak for the time when I was an active debater. So that was quite a while ago. And in terms of the modern contemporary times, I guess I can only, you know, you should take everything I say with a pinch of salt because I clearly am not as active. So I go on the basis of what I read or what I hear. So in terms of back at the time when I was a debater, um, look, I obviously think that there were many instances in which women were just not taken as seriously um and you know i wonder for example i took part and made all of these jokes about how stefan was writing my speeches right and i sometimes wonder nowadays if there was like a younger debater who was listening to that whether you know how did she feel about that like did that did that have an impact on her did you know other people making such comments and me playing into it did that deter someone from joining the community I don't know. The truth is, I, I hope not, because I think on balance, we were very inclusive and we were really trying to attract different audiences. So, you know, I think when I was starting and when I was debating, um, we were more inclusive on balance than most other, you know, institutions or groups or whatever. And we were really trying to be that. My concerns about modern times, and I, I, I saw bits and pieces of that. But my concern about the modern times is that this whole political correctness thing, this imposition of views, this aggressive behavior is now very deterring. Let me, let me be quite honest. If I was 21, 21 now and an undergraduate student, I would not join debating. I would not because it became a community where you can't debate crucial topics that still matter. I remember seeing Oxford IV and a scandal erupted because we've said a motion about abortion. How on earth are we an inclusive community when we can't debate an issue that continues to be so important across the globe that hasn't been set and agreed upon across the globe? Then, you know, this whole idea of like, if you just impose the quotas, you will resolve everything. You won't. You won't. I remember, I remember when I was like in, in Oxford and they wanted to introduce like a quota for for women and can ban, debate, ban debating societies from coming to major competitions if, do, if they don't have a minimal amount of women in their delegation. And I was like, how on earth can you do this? How blind can you be? Do you understand that not every country on this planet is a Western liberal democracy? And do you understand that if you wanna help, like, if you wanna help and attract these people, you have to adapt your approach. 
You can't just aggressively go to like a debating community and say to them, if you don't have that number of women, you're not allowed to compete. That's not a way, that's such a diminishing, patronizing way of speaking to people. And I just think that even when I was there and from what I'm hearing now, it's just much worse. This, this community is becoming as exclusive as it can be while parading some distorted notion of inclusivity, which is just damaging to the activity, not attracting the kind of people that I believe should be attracted to this community. And it's just showing so little understanding. You know, it's so nice when we say, oh, we're all inclusive. But you're really not, because if your policies mean that some debating circuits cannot attend your competition, then you're not being inclusive. Then what you're being is you're being a pain in the ass who thinks that decades, centuries of systemic discrimination can be resolved by one policy decided by a bunch of university students in a super privileged Western liberal university. So that's my that's my two cents on the issue right now. No, I totally agree. I think... Uh, this has been become like a, a reoccurring topic on the podcast. Because um, if you think about it, if these uh, motions or debates exist in real life, if you if your whole goal is to make the particular change that you want to make, convince people, let's say that uh, abortion is a right, then you would end up if you're fighting for that, having that conversation in real life, having even like actual uh, debates about it in real life on television or whatever. And if uh, you're brought up in a community that tells you this is not debatable, this is not something that we should be exactly. talking about, then <laughs> that, uh, that kind of uh, ruins the whole point of uh, debating is an activity that teaches you critical thinking and it prepares you for exactly. engaging into real life politics, blah, blah, blah. So exactly. they're, they're, of... totally, they're totally divorced from reality and very disrespectful to many people who have the right to legitimately disagree on certain topics. And if you want to persuade, like I used to teach debating and I had a bunch of like I taught a bunch of people who were extremely conservative. For example, very, very, very anti any LGBT plus rights. I purposefully set LGBT motions on almost every single workshop I gave them because I wanted to force them into a place where they have to think about these issues, where they have to build arguments in favor or against, where they have to read about these topics. And guess what? More often than not, I've seen people change their opinion. I've seen people evolve as thinkers. I've seen people become more tolerant, more liberal, more understanding. And the only way I've done that is basically by forcing them to engage in these kinds of topics. Like, I, I just think, I just think that the, whoever is in charge, so to say, of the debating community right now has to understand that this planet has like, whatever, over 6 billion people now. And many issues have not been settled. And those issues deserve to be debated if that community wants to call itself inclusive. If they want to just be preaching to the choir kind of community, to just have people who, who agree with them, fine. That is also within their right. But then just don't pretend to be inclusive because that's not, that is not inclusive. Like saying that anyone who has a different opinion to yours is not allowed to be a member of your community, come to your tournaments, or is like, you know, trashed on social media platforms that that kind of behavior that's exclusivity it's not inclusivity it's not the respect of freedom of speech that's not the respect of legitimate disagreement that's not even in the culture of debating the whole point of debating as i understood at the very least is that we talk about hard topics in a structured civilized way where we try to have arguments and that's just not what i feel i mean let me let me give an example 2014 zagreb euros for the first time, we have this debate about the gender pronouns. Should they be included? Should they not be included? Disagreements begin. Two delegations, I'm not going to name them, but everyone knows who they are, literally stood up and said, if you don't impose gender pronouns, we will leave. How is that inclusive? It's not inclusive. And there were legitimate arguments, you know, that, that had nothing to do with transphobia. It had to do, for example, that an activity that's already very difficult for ESL people, all of a sudden now requires them to use like terms that are just not into like in Serbian language, there is no day 
in a sense in which it exists in English language. Asking someone, boom, here you are, European Championship, you paid so much money to be here, you practiced so much to be here. Now, let me impose this particular issue on you as well. Didn't seem fair to me. Secondly, we thought, and I think this is legitimate, that what your pronoun is, is a very private question, and that it is totally inappropriate to ask you that in a room full of people. I think that's a legitimate point of contention, right? And, and finally, debating offers a gender neutral language. You can refer to the speakers by the role they have in debating. So misgendering need not be an issue. There was no debate. This debate never happened. I never had an opportunity to hear the rebuttal to what I'm saying or what other people were saying. No, it was like, either you do it our way or we'll fucking leave. So you cornered the whole tournament. Now that's not, it's not inclusivity. It's not debating. So yeah. No, to, to this day, when I'm asked this question at the debate competition, I say no preferences. And uh, I do it specifically for that reason, which is I really have never understood why is this something that we should be talking about and why are you not referring to the other speakers in their speaker position or their team as a whole or things exactly. like that. But I think the bigger, bigger part of this is exactly the conversation because it's it's weird and we always make this debate argument in debating this will lead to more discussion and we almost always seem to agree that more discussion is a good thing because uh, it bridges the gap in certain cases blah blah all of these debate analysis that uh, debaters have heard over a thousand times so why it isn't applied in this case is uh, weird to <laughs> because, me because honestly because they're hypocrites there is no, there is no other explanation. I can't, I can't have like a nice way of putting it. It's because they're hypocrites and because everyone is just obsessed about the optics. I know a bunch of people who disagree with 90% of things that we're talking about right now, but they're never going to say it in public because they're too scared about the optics. What are they going to think about me? Am I going to get to CA this competition? Am I going to get to be an independent adjudicator at that competition? That's hypocritical. That's it. Some people genuinely are like that and just want to exclude everyone who disagree. But in debating, they're going to build an argument that more discussion is good because it's going to win them debate. Other people might genuinely believe that further discussion is a good thing. But because they want to, you know, further their personal image across the debating community, they will just keep their mouth shut. Either way, very hypocritical. So <laughs> I want to end this um, segment uh, in a more fun way. So you obviously know about this, but uh, so there, there are a couple of uh, videos online of uh, Jordan Peterson speaking at Oxford <laughs> Union. <laughs> Usually the title is something along the lines of Jordan Peterson shoots down feminist or something like this. And uh, usually you're in the thumbnail. You are asking a question. Tell me a little bit more about that experience. Oh, so obviously, like, you know, that, that was, I think, in 2016, I was studying in Oxford and Jordan Peterson was becoming the thing, right? Because there was that Kathy Newman interview and all the rest of it. And to be honest, like, I understand the existence of people like Jordan Peterson. I think, you know, as as political correctness goes, there has to be someone to, to respond, even if his responses are sometimes totally moronic and idiotic, but you need to have like, you need to have some kind of reactions. So I read quite a lot about like what he wrote, read his book, went there. And th the best part about it is that my question has nothing to do with feminism. So that whole title, Jordan Peterson takes down a feminist. I am a feminist, but it happens to be the case that I really did not ask him a question that has anything to do with feminism. In fact, I was more interested in his like, it was a meta question about how he formulates his opinions in a sense that he began his talk by basically saying that there are two groups of people. There are conservatives and they have these kinds of characteristics and they're liberals and they have these kinds of characteristics. And these are the roles that conservatives are good for. And these are the lib like roles that liberals would be good for. And then he went on to explain all the details of that. And then at some point he gets back to what he calls Marxist. And oh my God, does that man not understand Marxism? No Marxist would think that identity politics is a good thing. Because from Marxist point of view, and I just have to say this because it agitates me so much that he doesn't know what's Marxism. The only struggle that matters is a class struggle. Any other struggle is just 
you know, moving the attention from what is really important. So this whole identity politics thing, a genuine Marxist would say, this is deflecting attention from what really matters. So he's dead wrong about what Marxism is. But anyway, and then he goes into what he calls Marxists, which is basically political correctness people, right? And then he says, they come to people and they tell them, this is what it means to be black and you have to behave in that way and this way. And as I was listening to him, I was like, hang on, you're doing the exactly same thing. So you are saying that political correctness people divide people into categories, assign characteristics to those categories and expect people to behave in that way. But literally 10 minutes ago, you've divided people into two categories, assigned them characteristics and told them what they should and shouldn't do. So that was my question to him. My question is, aren't you doing exactly the same what you de- accuse the other side of doing? Um, I-, I wasn't particularly satisfied with the answer. And of course, he deflected and went on to speak about political correctness people. And let me just put it out there. I don't agree with political correctness people. I also just don't agree with Jordan Peterson. I think both of them are dead wrong. <laughs> but that's that's what happened. No, when I... Um... When I watched that video, I kept thinking about a very recent debate I had, which is something along the lines of like, we regret uh, Marxism dying out in Western democracies, blah, blah, blah. So I start my speech with a wink uh, towards the Bosel speech. I'm like, uh, uh, panel, global Marxists live under a dictatorship, a dictatorship called uh, identity politics. Uh, <laughs> which pretty much uh, sums up uh, exactly what we're talking about. Absolutely. I just remember having a lot of fun with that. So yeah, it's a, it's a problem with categorization. To be fair, I, I I do think that like Jordan Peterson in that answer starts going in the right direction and then just uh, 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 switches on. It's like he starts the intellectual conversation and then switches on to uh, essentially continue on what he is trying to preach. Which yeah. is essentially to say, yes, categorization is bad, but then uh, we need categorization. And then, yeah, that's kind of, I kind of agree with that, but then you're doing the categorization. So how do we settle that particular point? I, I just thought it was uh, very interesting. <laughs> and it's specifically interesting in the context of this conversation, everything that you thought about in terms of how you view problem problematic uh, leftist behavior in uh, debating and how you can be easily portrayed as exactly the same thing uh, and put out uh, of context. That I've always um, uh, find very interesting. I have a question from the audience. Oh, is this (laughs) live? Like people are actually listening? (laughs) No, no, we're we're not live, but I I prepared a question from the audience. So the question is the following. and apparently this is maybe from someone who knows you. Uh, I guess we'll never know. It's anonymous. Uh, so it says, um, Helena used to have a very strong views on vegetarianism. Mm-hmm. Um, and it goes on to explain uh, a certain example from Oxford IV and the hog roast, which you can yes. talk about a little bit later. Oh, there's, uh, it's not an interesting story. I was just really pissed off that there was a roast and I was very triggered by that. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, the question is, she has since become an avid meat eater. What changed? Okay. So, actually, this is a very good way of illustrating what I was talking about before in terms of how debating can change your view. So, look, as a kid growing up, I was never a big fan of meat. Like, you know, I've never tried roast, for example, until actually quite recently. But um, I, I just, you know, didn't like meat. But I never thought about, like, the... I never thought about the problem from the animal rights point of view or the environmental concerns point of view. It just never crossed my mind. Until Siri and I went to Budapest, a debating tournament, and we got a motion. This house believes that if humanity wants to continue to eat meat, um, then people have to slaughter the animal they want to eat. And it was the first time I actually had to turn on my brain and like think about this problem. And we were the opening government and we won the round. And I remember Lila Kunig was the chair in that room. And I ended up speaking a lot with her about it afterwards. And literally in a week's time, I stopped eating meat because I just realized that I cannot justify this to myself from any angle. I'm privileged enough that I'm able to find myself non-meat alternatives to like have good nutrition and whatnot. Uh, when it comes to animal rights, I just thought that, you know, I, I don't see a difference between like 
you know, the marginal cases example, I find it, I find it very persuasive. I think, you know, if you have a sentient being that has a clear aim of continuing to exist, then if I don't need to kill it to survive, then I probably am not justified in killing it. And then when it comes to environmental concerns, I had a pretty much similar view. So basically, that's the example of how debating cannot just change the way you think, it can literally change the way you behave. Um, and I was a vegetarian until mid-2020. And basically for that time, I think about five or four years, I've spent being quite a militant vegetarian, like going around and giving shit to other people and making a scene at Oxford Ivy because of the hog roast. And there were other scenes in Singapore where probably I almost got arrested because I screamed at people for buying fish from the aquarium. Probably should not have done that, but thankfully I wasn't arrested. Uh, so anyway, like that, that's what I was. And then I kind of just understood that, you know, at one point, I guess, as I grew up and as I read more, uh, I realized that I'm entitled to have my own view, but propagating it in such an aggressive way is just first, not nice. And secondly, most of the time, just not really effective because screaming at people that they are crazy for eating meat is very unlikely to result in them stopping eating meat which is kind of what I'm trying to say to all of these politically correct people. If you call everyone who disagrees with you a ra racist, xenophobe, fascist, sexist, transphobe, homophobe, you're very unlikely to change their opinion. So then I just continued being a vegetarian, but not like militant one in a sense in which I was before. And then I have to say, my dad, he screwed it over. He came to London to visit me. His firm was having an event in London and they were taking everyone for dinner and the dinner was at the best steakhouse. And by that point, I've never tried a steak. So even before I became a vegetarian, as I say, I wasn't particularly big on meat. But I was always very keen to try a steak. I really wanted to try a steak. So my dad said, look, if you ever really wanted to try a steak, this, this is a good time for you to do that. So I tried a steak and I liked it. And I'm going to say it. I believe in all the principles that I've believed in before. And I really think that animal rights point of view we have zero arguments to justify eating meat and environment even very very similar to that but I just like steak too much I'm a hypocrite there it is I've said it <laughs> I tried the steak and I liked it it reminds me of the Katy Perry song yeah uh, <laughs> I, I had this joke with my friend um she she asked me we were actually speaking about meat and she asked me what happened to your morality Helena and I said reality so that's that's it. I just like steak too much. But I still I still think, I mean, my views haven't changed. I've just accepted that I'm not a morally consistent person. And that's very hard to do, honestly. Uh, especially when you're broadening your horizons on different political points of views. Uh, certain things might be morally correct, but might just not work in certain types of contexts. So it's... it's uh, it's very hard to achieve absolute uh, moral high ground. I think the problem is some people think they can, and that kind of plays into the whole political correctness thing. I think that's the point. I think, you know, if you want to be consistent, and I remember I had these conversations with people, you know, when they've asked me, why are you vegetarian? Why are you not vegan? If you're vegan, why are you not fruitarian and whatnot? If you want to be a moral being, like a moral human being, you're almost certainly not going to be consistent. There will be areas in life where you're more moral, less moral, more willing to make personal sacrifices to live in line with your principles, less sacrifices. Like it's just the second you embark on a journey of trying to do the good thing, you will be inconsistent. That's just how it is. No one is perfect. No one can always live in line with all of these great moral principles and ethical principles that we have. The easiest thing to do is to be a shithead and just say, fuck all principles, I'll do whatever. So as soon as you want to be a good person, a moral person, you're very likely to run into inconsistencies. And that's hard, but to me, still on balance, better than just being a shithead. So that's sort of how I'm thinking about it. And I apologize to all the cows. I'm <laughs> shithead to them. So you spent uh, quite some time living in the West. You are now, I think, living in the Balkans. Uh, what's the difference? Which is uh, the better option? Oh, well, that's a very hard one. I mean, the differences are, I think the first thing is like work-life balance. I think I think Balkan people prioritize. I, I have a sense that people in, at least people that I'm surrounded with, I don't want to make any generalizations, but my sense is that most people work to live in the Balkans, whereas 
the West, I wouldn't say that people lived to live to work, but I think that professional achievements, career prospects, the amount of time people are just focused on their jobs and their careers, like I think there is a huge difference between the two. Um, I think people in the Balkans are, th there was actually like, <laughs> during my master's degree, there was this um, girl from Belgrade who was studying uh, to become a movie director and she did a short eight minutes long movie about like immigrant experience, which is centered around me. And like, she has me in one chair where I'm speaking in Serbian and behaving as a Serb and talking about my life in the UK as a Serb. And then she has me like dressed up or polished with a British accent, talking about my life in Britain. And um, interestingly, at that time, I thought that I was never going to come back to Belgrade. So there was like a very somber note where I was like, I'm never going to live in a country where my parents are. Guess what? COVID happened and here I am. But um, I, I was talking there about this point where like in the UK, my life was always much more planned. If I wanted to meet up with friends, I would probably message them on a Monday to see what are they doing on a Friday. In the Balkans, things are much more spontaneous. I call you at 2 p.m. and I'm like, what are you doing tonight? Let's meet up. That's usually like, you know, there's more spontaneity in how, how people live. Um, I think people in the Balkans are way more communal. I remember having this conversation with some of my friends back in London where they were like, if you have a problem, you sit at home, eat ice cream and cry it out by yourself. In the Balkans, if you have a problem, your house becomes a train station where everyone is just coming and going and they're constantly being there for you and your phone is just ringing and people are, everybody, everybody becomes a part of your problem. Everybody wants to be a part of your solution. And that's just not... I think in, in, in the West, at least in my experience, again, I don't want to generalize. I can really just speak about my life in Oxford and London. Maybe other places are different. Maybe other people's lives in Oxford and London are different. But my experience overall was that like people felt uncomfortable to tell you that they have a problem because they thought that it was an imposition. I, I remember, like for example, my second week in Oxford, uh, I was really having a problem to open a bank account because I didn't have a credit history in the EU and I was really fucking pissed off. And um, I'm, I'm getting lunch for myself and I ran into this colleague and he asks me, hi, how are you? And I'm telling him, oh my God, I have like such a shit day. And I could almost see him turn into a question mark and being totally confused by my answer. So I'm like, have I said something wrong? And he's like, oh, well, you know, I just didn't expect you to actually tell me that you're not okay. And I'm like, why did you ask? So we end up sitting down having coffee and he tells me like, you know, when people ask you, how are you? And you're not particularly close friends. The expectation is that no matter what is going on in your life, you just say, I'm fine, turn around and walk away. Um, rather than actually tell them, oh, I'm, I'm having such a terrible day because it's seen as imposition. So I would say that that is a big difference. Um, if you asked me this question five or six years ago, I would probably say that there are substantial political differences and the corruption in the Balkans is much worse and the nationalism here is much worse and all the rest of it. I'm not sure that is the case, unfortunately, anymore, not because the Balkans got better, but because I think the West, the West is really like politically collapsed. Like the, the, the scandals that happened during COVID, the, you know, it's just not, I mean, the UK saw 45 days prime minister talk about a stable political system, you know, so, um, and I would definitely say that political correctness is a big difference. I think, you know, at least Serbia, you know, despite having a gay prime minister is a very, very conservative society. Gay marriage is still not legal. I, I don't think my I don't think being gay in Serbia is a nice or pleasant experience. In fact, I think they are really discriminated against. At the same time, you know, we are seeing this whole um, you identify as a woman midway through a rape trial and you end up in a female prison, which happened in Scotland. So that that that's clearly a major difference as well. Yeah, I've always thought about this, um, and and I think it's really one of the big differences the human perspective. Because if you go into the political side of things, there's always even even if they're not the same, there are different types of problems that uh, keep reoccurring, and you can never be fully satisfied with uh, the political situation in any type of country, especially over a long time. So. Yeah, I think people should be thinking about these things. And in general, I've always, uh, I've never got this uh, with like uh, uh, this uh, cultural thing where uh, you're always supposed to be smiling, always supposed to be saying that you're okay. Because in my mind, it's always like, if, 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 uh, if I want to say some of these things, if I'm worried what the other person will think about me, I'm more likely to be worried about somebody that I'm close with. Uh, 
whether maybe they're in a bad situation and I don't want to overburden their life with my problems. But mm -hmm. I never find myself thinking about that with a stranger. So it would be, in fact, sometimes easier to just say, oh, yeah, bro, uh, or, or uh, whatever. Uh, my life is not go good right now. What can you do? And sometimes you can get better perspective exactly from those conversations exactly. with strangers. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting. Um, going back to the debate thing, <laughs> uh -huh. um, I, I think you recently did a tournament with Siri. I think it was like last year. Oh, yes, um, last year, 8th of May, yeah. Yeah. yeah how, how did that go? How did it feel going back? Uh, oh, it was really, really. Uh, I mean, honestly, it was a bit, I mean, it was nice to like be back with Siri and do this one last time. But honestly, I was so bored. I barely gave like a seven minute speech. Siri knows, I think in two rounds, I gave shorter, shorter speech than, um, than seven minutes. I'm just, I mean, I did it because I promised Siri I was going to do one last tournament with him. I was very disappointed that he decided to choose Denny Crane in Belgrade because I thought if we're going to do one last tournament, we might as well just go somewhere like Lisbon, Madrid, some, you know, some exciting city for at least. Uh, and I felt bad because it was like, I'm not the kind of team that should win Denny Crane of 2022. This is a tournament that should be won by people who are intermediate or just starting their advanced course, like not me. So, but you know, it was, it was nice. It was nice. Like I can't, you know, it was, it was nice to, it was nice to try and do it again, I guess, but I didn't, you know, it confirmed, it confirmed what I knew, which is I'm not interested in doing debating. I'm done, done, done. And uh, what, what were your thoughts about the current generation of debaters, uh, maybe in Serbia in this case? Well, the problem was that Siri and I were not the only dinosaurs who decided to show up at this tournament. So there were more than one round where I debated with people that I know for a fact were active debaters when I was debating. So in terms of the novice ones that I had the chance to see in some rounds, um, they were good. They were excellent. I think, you know, they are, they're the new generation and I hope they break the current records, you know, be the first open speaker and be great at it. I think they're great. Going back a little bit, uh, when you got your first achievements in debating, uh, did you receive a lot of recognition in Serbia? Were people talking about you in news outlets and stuff like that? Yes, yes, pretty much so. Like, um, we, Siri and I were on the front cover of so many different newspapers. We just, at, at one point, I think we were jumping out of people's refrigerators. <laughs> like, there was quite, quite a lot of press attention. And then that kind of stack on in terms of, other tournaments, they also like followed us around. And there was quite a lot of coverage in that. And I think that really helped. I think, you know, it just gave importance to debating. It gave debating the spotlight it didn't have before. And I want to hope that that made it easier for newer generations to like get the funds if they needed it, to get the institutional support when they needed it. I really hope that it made a change for the better. But um, there was quite a lot of press interest and people knew about us. And like even to this day, sometimes when they invite me to like, provide political commentary, um, you know, they ask me stuff about debating or they remember me from debating or they know that I used to debate. So like it definitely stayed on and it was, um, it was a big thing. It was, it was almost surreal, you know, we came back from Chennai and then all of a sudden all the press was just like onto us because, you know, it's New Year's, everyone wants the happy good news and this was great news, so. Yeah, it was a similar thing when we, uh... So, like, we made it to the finals this year, so we go back to Bulgaria. There's a bunch of press, there's a bunch of stuff going on. Um, so, from that perspective, my question would be, what, what is the cringiest moment uh, of an interview that you've had uh, during those? Because oh. the, the, the fact of the matter is a lot of these people don't know what debating is, what oh, actually the, you're doing. Oh, there, there, was, uh, there was this show, uh, which was uh, conveniently called uh, Women, uh, and they've asked me what a guy needs to have for me to like him. So <laughs> what was perhaps even more interesting is that the two key speakers were me and uh, this guy who was a lawyer who just won a moot court competition. And um, they've asked him, like, so are the attorney's office now chasing you to be their lawyer? And then they've asked me, what does the guy need to have for you to like him? And I was like, oh, great. 
So this is what I'm down to. I'm down to um, I'm down to what a guy needs to have. Or you know, the question like, do guys have a problem because I speak a lot? <laughs> that kind of those are really cringy times. Yeah, I had a similar story where the the host uh, told me about how he's losing all of the debate with debates with his wife. So he was interested whether women are good at debating as well. Uh, it was very funny because, like, this is the year. Like this year, the best speaker in the world is a woman. So, oh, uh, really? Congrats! Yeah, that's uh, that's very, uh, that's that's very always successful. Uh, <laughs> always fun to have. Okay, one last uh, question. Now that you mentioned it, um, what's your best story from Chennai Worlds? We've already talked about uh, it a little bit on the podcast, uh, but uh, more from the CA perspective uh, with Harish. So from the debater perspective, <laughs> how was it? Well, the, the, the best thing is that I don't have a PTSD from it. Uh, <laughs> um, what was the best story? I mean, this is the problem. Like, of course, the best story is that we've achieved the successes that we did. But the problem is that Chennai was so chaotic that all you can remember is like, you know, you come to your hotel room and there is this third person you've never met who all of a sudden is sleeping in your room because otherwise they're out on the street because there are not enough hotel rooms. Or this moment when they've decided to lock us out half an hour before midnight on New Year's Eve because randomly the hotels decided that all room services have to be paid now, not during checkout. Or when the police came to arrest the Pakistani delegation or when the judges went on a strike because the IA money wasn't paid accordingly. Um, trying to remember. I mean, I guess, you know, I guess getting to the finals, I really didn't. I, I really like. So this is the story, right? So so before before Chennai, Siri and I had Manchester. Actually, I think Berlin World might have been before Manchester Euros now that I'm. Now that I'm doing chronology in my mind, it's possible that I lied to you at the start of the talk and that it was Berlin Worlds and Manchester, but all the other facts stand true. Anyhow, so Manchester Euros was a failure for me and Stefan, partly because, I'll be very honest, I was not pre prepping for that tournament. I really wasn't. Siri took it very seriously. I did not. I kind of just assumed, because we were so good at all other competitions, that we're going to walk into Manchester Euros and just be as good. Um... So Siri was quite mad after Manchester Euros for quite understandable reasons. Obviously, like, I think the failure was to both of us, but I think that there was a source of frustration for me not preparing. And clearly, like, there were some doubts as to how do we now approach Chennai and will I take it as seriously and whatnot? And of course I did. Um, but clearly taught by the experience of not qualifying for Berlin Worlds, not breaking in Manchester, we didn't go to Chennai with any particularly high expectations. We went with, like, a lot of desires and willingness to put the effort and achieve a lot but I don't think that realistically we were anticipating reaching the final and I think that moment is definitely like the biggest highlight that I can remember you know that that I, I felt that that was the first so in the same way in which I've told you that Zagreb Euros was a turning point where I've realized that I don't have to play into the ice ceiling that was preset for EFL and ESL community I think in Chennai, I've realized that I don't have to play into the ice ceiling that at the time people thought exists for the Balkan debating community. That that was a turning point where I think Siri and I realized that like we can compete with Israel, we can compete with the Netherlands, we can compete with all of these like major ESL circuits and and win. And I think that that realization came when we broke to to the final. But this was so many years. This was almost ten years ago. Jesus, I really am a dinosaur. Speaking of dinosaurs, um, we have this segment on the show. It's called uh, The Greatest Debater of All Time. Uh, and I always ask this same question. But you can tell me a little bit more about how you generally approach the topic. Um, who is uh, the greatest debater of all time? Shang Wuli. No questions asked. Shang Wuli. Like, I, I think, I mean, I remember watching the videos of him and just being you know shocked absolutely shocked that anyone can be this good that anyone can be that smart that anyone can be that structured right and I was obviously trying to learn as much as I can from him but at one point I can't remember when but I know that I was seeing the LSE and I know that at that point Siri and I were quite established already as debaters I don't know if that was 
after Malaysia and Vienna or at some point, but already Siri and I had made enough successes on an international stage that we weren't just novice team or anything like that. And they've invited me to CA the LSE and they put me to chair the top room in round five. I was really unhappy. that I, I mean, I was very happy that I chaired it because that was and remains and probably forever will be the best debate I've ever watched in my life. So I remember that it had Stephen, it was Sheng and Ashish in a team. Stephen Regevinitsen was in another team. Can't remember who he spoke with. There was Jack Watson with someone. And then there was Fred Cowell with someone. It was just a stellar debate. I It was the first and only time that I really... I. I left the room and I said to the speakers, I made a call and I had one wing. The debate ended. We only knew that we think Sheng and Ashish won and we had no idea what to do with second, third and fourth because it was just so good. Like, I think the lowest speakers I've given in that round was like 85 and I'm known as giving notoriously low speaks. So that's saying something, right? Um, and I came out and I said to the teams, look, I... I hope you all broke because I have no idea if my call was right or not. And, you know, there were so many ways you could judge that debate. But Shang's speech, like at that point, you know, I was already a somewhat established debater. I went to international competitions. I've heard so many people debate live on video. I, I have never seen, I, I can't remember what was the motion or what exactly was their case. But I remember that when he said the first sentence of their case, I thought, what? By the time he finished his speech, I was willing to get up and ensure that whatever he was arguing is immediately turned into practice because that's the best fucking idea anyone's ever had. So shankly, it's, it's going to be shankly. And I miss, you know, I, I, I'm, I can't miss because, you know, I didn't, I didn't debate when he was debating, but I'm so sad that I didn't get to, that I didn't get to like be a debater at the time when he was debating. I would probably take a fourth in any round that he goes head to head with me, but it would be, it would be a great experience. And I just think also like, you know, I think the other point is just about, it's not just about the way he speaks. And it's also about what I think he did for that community. I, I remember, you know, he was still somewhat active when the whole safe spaces thing became a thing. And he was really trying to fight against it. He was really trying to protect what this activity, well, was meant to be, because I don't think that it is that thing anymore. And, and the way he did it, you know, I, I appreciate him for that. I appreciate that at the time when he was done in terms of debating and in terms of seeing, he was, you know, willing to, to come back and use the credibility and, and the reputation that he has to try and call some common sense. Um, but yeah, so it would be him. What do so most people say? I'm curious. Well, we, we've received... So um, I'm a little bit ahead because uh, I, I do these recordings ahead. So there are quite a few episodes that aren't out. But we've had uh, takes uh, that uh, it's Shen Wu. We've had takes that Shen Wu is overrated. We've had uh, <laughs> multiple... Wrong. Multiple yeah. different takes. We have uh, Harish. Who else do we have uh, in terms of the... We had like goats uh, by uh, categories. Uh, many, 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 many different options. Uh, this okay. is like one of the reasons that I'm doing these podcasts. Uh, uh, well, not necessarily to crown who is the goat, but uh, more of... Uh, kind of spread the knowledge around because many of the current debaters could can barely find uh, Shenmue speech online. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's kind of fun to listen to um, you and other people that have actually seen uh, Shenmue yeah. in person, listen to the speeches in person. Uh, we've had uh, like debaters such as Ashish who have spoken with uh, Shenmue and have provided that perspective um, but I've been hearing good things. I've been hearing very good things about Chen Wu. No, uh, yeah, so. no, it's um, it's really. I think debating has been blessed that um, that a person like him has been part of that community, and he was not. He's not overrated. I promise. I heard him speak. He's not overrated. <laughs> so to 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 expand a little bit, that uh, which are some honorable mentions, uh -huh. top five, top ten. 
Oh, gosh. Uh, are we doing them by any category or is it just like top five? However you want to approach it. Okay. Um, I mean, they're all really going to be dinosaurs and I'm not even sure that if people like are going to know who I'm talking about. So Shang, Harish, Harish, I have to say Harishi, uh, one of my closest friends too. Um, I'm trying to be fair to everyone. Uh, who would be number three? Who would be number three? Steven Roger Venison. Would have to be Steven. Also, like, I just have to say, Steven is like, not just one of the best debaters, he's also just like one of the best humans to have been on this planet. And I totally recommend if you can try and get him to, to talk. I, I see eight talent with him. Well, it was the first time I have to say this. Steven and I were ahead of times. I remotely see eight talent three years before COVID. <laughs> um, but he's genuinely like one of the nicest people I've ever met. For me personally, like Anat Shapira was also a very, very big inspiration. So she would have to be featured in that list too. I must be forgetting people. Who else were the champions? Well, you know what? I'm just going to say it. It's Siri. It has to be. Like, he's also one of the greatest. Um, who, else, who else are the names? Help me out. I'm forgetting people. I'm having a blockage. Well, that's the thing that um, you're. I'm also, from, I have to say Lovro and Tin, right? I have to say Lovro and Tin because they've done the unimaginable. So I have to say Lovro and Tin. Oh, Dan Lahav, Dan Lahav too. Oh my God, so many good names. I don't know. I'm, I'm worried I'm going to forget some very big people. I'm going to stop no, here. I don't know. I no, I think I think that's fair. And I think uh, that's fair. There, there are many different uh, options. Nobody, I, I definitely don't think that somebody that you haven't mentioned is gonna really care about it anyway. We don't get, we don't get that much views on the podcast. Oh, no, for, me, for me, it's more about like doing it justice, right? Like making sure that I've really mentioned everyone. But it's just, I'm such a Shang fan girl that that's just who always like comes to mind. The best debater ever, Shang Wuli, like no questions asked. <laughs> You should have asked. So this is what we do next time we have a call Siri. We ask him all the stuff. That I'm <laughs> I remember, like I remember the feelings, right? I remember the memory, like the. I remember things that were injected with like feelings of happiness, anger, rage. But the what I've judged, what I've chaired, no, like I remember this LSE round because it was the first time where like I was just sitting there looking at the ballot, unable to 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 complete it because I just don't know who won. So that was that's the memory, right? The memory is the confusion and the fear that I've just judged eight debaters who were probably in the top eight ever best in the whole world, right? And I can't say who won, who lost. So that's the kind of thing that I remember. No, I, I totally relate to that. So we've had this conversation of like, which are your favorite debates ever? And I keep going back to debates that I've actually debated in and... Uh, it's not uh, maybe maybe I'm uh, uh, egocentric in that way, but it's just way more visceral to me. Like uh, there were emotions, I cared about it. I knew what was going on behind the scenes. Obviously, I would think about these things. For me, it was clear than a random debate that I watched online or even yeah. maybe a debate that I watched in person. So it has always made much more sense to me that kind of. Uh, aspect to it and i i'm not one of those people who remembers all the arguments and all the motions and can uh go into a debate and think about oh this is what Syria and helena ran in 2014 we can run something like this i'm not that type of uh, uh no speaker. no i was never like that either because i just can't can't remember you know can't 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 remember like when I'm in the heat of the moment, I can't really remember what someone ran and try and use that argument. Yeah, that's uh, that's fair. So, at the end of uh, this podcast, um, I like to have this segment where uh, we kind of do a, a reverse role. Um, so, what is something that you want to talk about? If this was your platform. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I would ask you 
do you feel, because I assume you're more active in the circuit than I am now, do you feel that my interpretation of how political correctness now limits what debating is, is true or not? Am I wrong? So it's an interesting question, right? Because, uh, and I think I have an interesting perspective on it. So most of these things I would agree with. The fact of the matter is, I think debaters in the community, not like just speakers, but just debaters in general, because it's a small community, they have a huge effect on, uh, on it and what we think about and things that we talk about. So while I wouldn't say it has changed and there are some things that I'm very not fond of and some recent things that have happened that I'm very not fond of that I don't want to talk about right now. But um, it does seem like, and I'm going to bounce the question back after the answer because I think this is interesting to talk about. It doesn't seem like it's necessarily done deal. It doesn't seem like it's necessarily uh, can never be a better version of what we are. It doesn't seem like if we have these conversations that we're having right now and we're in a space where we've achieved a lot of the things that uh, people on the left have wanted in terms of how like uh, certain types of policies, certain types of space, safe space, etc. Like the fact of the matter is uh, at this world semis this year or technically last year, I don't know, uh, most recent worlds, me and Roman uh, made a very right case uh, uh, in the in the semis and did mention things about like abortion is an actual debate did mention things such as like uh, well that was mostly Roman but like uh, uh, Bernie Sanders is the devil and things like that so and we, we went through that final and to be fair like after those speeches I was like um we might lose this one just because we made this type of case and we didn't care about the rhetoric and we didn't smooth it out and we didn't pretend. And I start my speech in that round with, by saying for, for six years I have been pretending in front of all of you to be left wing, telling all the things that you wanted me to tell you so that I can win debates and this ends now. And this is how I start my speech. And for us, that was very cool to do. And we went through that uh, particular final uh, that, that particular semi and, and it's uh, it was okay like we didn't get cancelled we did not get uh, it's the, the debate is online you can watch it nothing has happened so from my perspective all of these problems are prevalent the question is can we change it I am in a space in my life right now with the debating community where I think maybe we can and this is one of the reasons why I like this podcast we can try to do it so yeah. the the question back to you would be, do you think uh, that it is inevitable? It's only going to get worse and so we can never be better at uh, actually inviting different types of people into the community? Or is there a chance for it? Oh, I always think there is a chance. I just think... Uh... I just think one needs to be very persistent. I think that single failures shouldn't discourage people to continue the overall fight that they have. And I think, unfortunately, for a lot of people, this might also mean accepting certain personal certain personal consequences. You know, making certain views public right now can come with the cost of not being invited to see a specific tournament, not being invited to, I don't know, be an independent adjudicator or something like that. But I think, you know, if one is persistent and committed to one's goal then i think i think it's totally worth continuing the fight i just i just don't think that again take what i say with a pinch of salt because i don't know but at least when these whole discussions were starting back when i was there it was increasingly looking like it was not a discussion it was a very exclusionary so i think it's a hard fight but definitely definitely winnable because i don't think that most people actually think you know that topics should be restricted because they are whatever triggering or offensive or inappropriate. I don't think that's the, that's the majority's opinion. I just think the majority is a bit concerned to perhaps speak about it publicly because of the consequences and because they think that they are alone in their opinion. But when you have 
prominent figures who are advocating for such positions, I think the majority is also happy to be, you know, participating in that. So I think that's that's what's important. And I don't think that stands true just for debating. I think that's just like generally, generally the case. I think, you know, I, I did a PhD in the role of propaganda in war. And one of the things that I realized is that people often have opposing views to what is perceived as the mainstream view. They're just too concerned to say it publicly because they don't think that they will be supported. They think they will run into a backlash. So I think for as long as these people are given space and reassurance that they can say what they mean, that there are people who agree with them, the fight makes sense. So I totally think you should be doing that. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm out of the circuit. I fight my fights elsewhere. But if, if me saying some of the stuff that I've said in this podcast is part of that fight, then I'm very happy and proud to, to have been a part of it, at least to a very small degree. Well, it's not by intent. We, we didn't actually, uh, uh, you know, talk before the podcast, oh, now we are going to shit on PC culture in debating. It's just uh, a matter of experience and a matter of uh, what gets to you and what are some problems that uh, you always figure. Um, so so a, a part of the whole PC conversation, is there something uh, that you would like to change about the debating community? that you feel like has always been there and maybe it's an easy fix, maybe not so easy fix. Well, the first thing is obviously do not, do not cancel motions on, on the grounds of triggering or offensive. I just think again, to re-invoke Sheng's analysis method, if you can come up with five arguments in favor and five arguments against, I think the motion is good. And for as long as you can do that, I think that's fine. I don't think that triggering or offensive can be the criteria because this is the thing that I used to argue even back then, right? Because like, if something is triggering or if, like anything can be triggering or offensive to anyone. So if we decide to restrict motions because they can be triggering or offensive, one of two things is going to happen. We're either literally going to have to restrict everything because, you know, you don't know what triggers me. I don't know what triggers you. I don't know what triggers some other person. We all come from different kinds of backgrounds, different kinds of things that are triggering. So then we'll just end up debating about flowers. Or alternatively, you decide that you are going to prioritize some people's triggers over others. And for example, restrict topics around abortion, but not restrict topics around, say, Yugoslavia or Israel. That's just not fair. That's very hypocritical. Um, so subsequently, I think the best way forward is to actually remember what debating is about. And it's about debating on difficult topics that, you know, have reasonable disagreements about which we can have a legitimate discussion and subsequently, I think that's the first fix. Stop canceling motions because they are triggering, triggering or offensive. And I think there's a lot of auto-censorship. There was at least when I was there. So I would just cancel all of that. Like, don't do that. If, if, if you can come up with good arguments for four teams, just leave the topic be. The second thing is I would absolutely and definitively cancel the gender pronoun because I just don't think that is acceptable on, for the reasons I've listed already. And Whenever I see a tournament, I refuse to ask that. Whenever I was asked that as a speaker in the round or as the wing in the round, I would always say that I declined to answer because this is not this is not the forum where I should be asked that kind of a question. Um, and I guess I would just ask people to, I don't know if this is something that makes sense in English, but get their heads out of their asses and understand that the real world is really complicated, really different, difficult, really multifaceted. And that if we want to be a community that has any real meaningful impact, that can make any real and meaningful change, we then have to approach the world as such. We cannot expect that the whole world works like a small privileged debating society in a Western liberal democratic university room. That's just not how this world works. And if this activity aspires to be something more than just an activity for the rich and privileged, then it actually has to behave that way. And that means like approaching issues in a multifaceted way. For example, as I've said, I was very strongly against the policy that delegations should be canceled and banned from competing in worlds and world euros if they don't have enough female participants in their delegation. Not because I think women shouldn't debate. Obviously, I think they should debate. But because I don't think that's the policy which will get female participants in debating circuits that have struggled to attract them. The real approach would be for all of these people who wanted to vote this to instead go to these countries and see what is going on. Why are women not coming? Are they coming and then leaving? Are they not coming at all? What are the reasons? And then to try and have tailor-made campaigns for those specific debating circuits 
that would attract female participants. Because I bet you that across countries, there are different reasons why they have more or less female participants. So if you want to get more women on the circuit, go out there, find out why there are no female participants on the circuit and do something to change that, given the issue that you've identified, rather than these kind of one size fits all approaches that's almost never true. Like rarely in life will you find a one size that fits six billion plus people. So that's sort of, those are the kinds of things that I would probably seek to do. Yeah, and to, to speak into debate terms, exactly. a lot of what you're saying is arguments that people are making and debating right now. Yeah. Maybe not in this particular context, but like even when we talk about intersectionality, even when we talk about different uh, approaches to uh, feminism or uh, LGBT activism in the developing world, we are always talking about different types of uh, contexts and how that is important when we are implementing a strategy of motion or whatever. Exactly. So I would urge people to use what you have said here as an example and as an um, inspiration to think about the arguments that they're making. Many of them are very good and already exist and imp implement them in their own life, in their own type of thinking when they are actually supporting certain types of policies, when they're having actual conversation on how our community should look like. Um, yep. I think, you know, to, to put it in a simple term, I think they should put their money where their mouth is and behave more consistently with what they argue in debating. Then, you know, come for that. Does that make sense? Put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. That's like a saying, you know, you keep preaching for something, but then when you need to put your money to do it, then people often give up. So similarly, if you're happy to make an argument X in debating, then when it comes to your own behavior, behave in line with what you've argued in the debate. Don't like pretend you didn't say it. That's sort of how I'm thinking about it. Because I just think, as I say, like, I think I was a really good debater. I genuinely do think that. Um, and I would not have joined the community right now. If, if I was an undergraduate student, because I just wouldn't find it intellectually stimulating or intellectually challenging as I did before. As I say, I have personally been touched and changed my views and behavior thanks to a debate. And I have taught a lot of people who have gone through the same process just on different topics. And I think the only way to get there is by having all of those debates. So that's, that's sort of what I would, what I would say. I think that's a great note uh, to finish on. Uh, thank you, uh, Helena, for doing this conversation. Thank you so much. It was very nice to kind of go back in time and revoke some of, like, evoke some of the memories that I haven't thought about in a really long time and speak about certain things that I haven't spoken about or thought about for a really long time. So thank you for the invite.